Welcome back to EDH Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and I'm making one more video about Modern Horizons 3. Of course, there's a ton to talk about, but I haven't talked about the Commanders at all yet, and it's it's kind of funny. This is like the first set I remember in a long, long time where people weren't really buzzing about the Commanders. I hardly paid attention to them at all as they were coming out, funny enough. And usually I, I pay quite a bit of attention to the Commanders for obvious reasons. But, you know, as I've alluded to in my first two videos where I talk about the 99 cards, one of the reasons why I think the Commanders from the set have kind of flown under the radar is because there's just so many ridiculous 99 cards and, you know, the Commander staples and the auto includes and the strict upgrades that I think a lot of people are paying more attention to those cards and, and less attention to the commanders. So, you know, it, it's kind of funny. I haven't seen people talk about the commanders much from this set at all yet. So I'm going to do so here. Certainly there are a few worth talking about. Let's get to it. I will start out with Thelia Exuberant Shepherd, which I already talked about in a spoiler video, but I'm talking about it again because it's probably one of my favorite commanders from the set. I think if I was to pick one commander to build around from this set, it would be this one. One on a white dog, 2-2 two, two flash. When Philia Exuberant Shepherd attacks, exile up to one other target non-land permanent at the beginning of the next end step. Return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. If it entered under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on Philia. So I know this might not look like much. It might just look like a mono white blinking deck, but it's really a lot more than that. Um, first of all, I like the flash on here. The flash seems a little weird, but the flash is actually great for a commander with an attack trigger because it's sort of pseudo haste. Obviously, you flash it out in your opponent's end step, and then on your turn, you untap and away you go. You can attack right away. And so I, I like that a lot. I also really like, I mean, there's two things here I really like that make it a really interesting build around. The first one is you can hit non land permanence, and that's actually really rare. Repeatable blinking for non-land permanence is rare. Unfortunately, it doesn't hit lands. There's some really neat things you could do here if it hit lands. But even being able to hit enchantments, artifacts, planeswalkers, you could very easily make a super friends deck with this. I mean, it wouldn't be the best one ever, but that would be a neat way to go because of course you could play your planeswalker, minus it right away, and then blink it. It comes back into play, back up to the normal amount that it's supposed to have. You're putting counters on your commander, so you can do a little bit of that. I, I wouldn't do too much, but you could do a little bit. The biggest thing, though, I like here, and I talked about this in a video a few months ago about how I was building a deck around Containment Priest, and Containment Priest is such a funny fit in this deck. Not funny for your opponents, I don't think, because, of course, being able to exile your opponent's stuff means you can permanently exile your opponent's creatures with a Containment Priest in play. That is a really interesting way to go with it. You can get into some really neat shenanigans here when blinking your opponent's stuff. I recommend go watching that video. Might give you, that was a white blue deck, but it might give you some really interesting ideas to go with this commander. I, I just, I really like the idea of I can blink my opponent's stuff or mine, and also I can blink stuff that isn't creatures. Some really neat ways you can go with this commander. All right, Arna Kenurid Sky Captain. Also a commander that I already touched on. Two white, blue, and a black human knight 4 4 flying lifelink has ward discard a card, which is not the best ward ever, but it's okay. Whenever a modified creature you control attacks, double the number of each kind of counter on it. Then for each non token permanent attached to it, create a token that's a copy of that permanent attached to that creature. So this is a very powerful ability. I suspect this will be a very popular commander. I think likely it's going to be like top three probably from this set. How it typically works now because we get so many commanders in every single set. Although I will say there wasn't a ton in this set. It was a little bit lower than the last few sets. But because we have so many commanders already to choose from, what usually ends up happening is the top three or four are really, really popular and everyone goes after them. And then the rest, it, it sort of trails off really quickly. And this is probably going to be in that first group that's going to be pretty popular. There's a lot you can do here. I know a lot of people will look at this and they might go with a Voltron strategy, flying lifelink ward discard a card. That's not a bad start for a Voltron commander. And of course you need your commander on the battlefield already. I kind of think that it might be better to go with another creature. It, you know, your commander says whenever a modified creature you control attacks. So if you already have a creature in play that is modified, 
then you play your commander. You can immediately attack with that creature. For me, though, I would go with one specific theme. Uh, in other words, because, of course, modified means a few different things. You can do the counters theme. You can do auras or you can do equipment. I would probably do only one of those um, because then you, obviously you can more focus on it. So for me, I'm doing plus one, plus one counters or any kind of counters, I guess. Maybe just you could come up with some really neat counters. Uh, again, doubling the counters on stuff obviously works good with plus one, plus one counters, but shield counters or, you know, coming up with these other interesting counters would be a really neat go to, way to go with it. Um, again, I had thrown out the very unique idea, if you're looking for a unique idea for this guy, of I animate my planeswalkers. <laughs> so a Luxio or something like that. There's actually a couple of ways to turn your planeswalkers into creatures. And of course, they've already got counters on them, so they come pre-modified. And all you have to do is then attack with, you know, whatever. It, do it doesn't have to be your commander. It can be any creature. And you can double the number of loyalty counters on your Planeswalker and ultimate right away. That's kind of a neat way to go with this commander. There's probably a lot of neat ways to go with this commander. But for me, I would probably do either. Uh, I'm doing that one theme like counters or I'm doing equipment. You could do an Esper equipment deck here or you could do an Esper aura deck here. I would probably pick one and go with it. Let's talk about Kudo King Among Bears. Green and a white bear, 2-2. Two, two. Other creatures. Creatures have base power and toughness 2-2 two, two on our bears in addition to their other types. So this is a funny commander. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people just thought it was a funny commander when they first saw it. There is some neat things you can do here. The big thing here, and of course, everyone's going to think bear tribal because, you know, a lot of people, the first thing they think of is tribal whenever they see a commander like this. For me, the big thing here is turning creatures into tutus. And of course, it turns your opponent's creatures into tutus as well. That's actually a really powerful ability. And... That, for me, is what I would probably build around more. Obviously, you can do the Bears Tribal stuff in your deck. There's not a lot, though, right? It's not, it's not like there's a ton of support for Bear Tribal. I would focus more on my creatures are 2-2 two -two creatures and my opponent's creatures are 2-2 two -two creatures. I, I think this is probably my second choice for the commander that I would build around if I was choosing one from this set. And I would go down the rabbit hole a little bit I will throw Reverence. Reverence is probably, that that's a card I, I mentioned, I think I recommended on my 10 cards videos a long time ago. I used to play it. You know, it's not the greatest Pillow Fort effect ever, but it is a slam dunk in this deck. That, that's why I like, you know, when you see these new commanders, that's what commander's all about for me. Here's this really neat old card that has a very specific ability that fits perfectly with Kudo because, of course, creatures with two power can't attack you. So as long as your commander and your reverence is in play, you can't be attacked. Um, unless your opponents, of course, have some anthem effect, they're putting counters on their creatures, stuff like that. That's another way you could go here, is you could do the plus one, plus one counter thing, because, of course, this is base power and toughness 2-2, two, two, so counters are going to add on top of that. There's a lot of ways you can go, right? I mean, you could do hydras here, funny enough. This could make for a hydra commander, because, of course, most hydras are zero zeros with the counters. I'm not saying that's a great way to go. I'm just giving that as an example where you have a zero zero creature that now has counters on it. So, of course, instead of being a zero zero, it's going to be a two two. So it's going to get two bigger. That's not the greatest way to go ever, maybe. But, um, you know, may maybe you could just go down the road of finding really neat creatures that are like a zero power, like an ornithopter, right? So now I can throw an ornithopter in my deck and it's a zero mana tutu. That's pretty good, right? So maybe you could do that. There, there actually is a lot of neat ways to go with this commander, I think. We got a new Ashling, Ashling Flame Dancer. Is this the third Ashling? I'm not sure. But anyway, we got another Ashling, two red, red, Elemental Shaman, four, four. You don't lose unspent red mana as steps and phases end. So that's definitely something that can be used. And a card that I have recommended on my channel quite a bit, maybe more than any other card, is Braid of Fire. There's a card that is a slam dunk in this deck. A slam dunk in this deck. Again, just like Reverence in the Kudo deck, to me, it's like you got to put that in there. You got to put Braid of Fire in this deck because it is just free mana, right? One of the downsides of Braid of Fire, and I've recommended that card for a few decks where you can actually use the mana on your upkeep. Here, you don't lose unspent red mana as steps and phases end. So of course you just add free mana on your upkeep and then save it until, you know, whenever you want, I guess. Save it to your main phase, obviously, and you can use it to cast stuff. Pretty fantastic include, I think. There's a few cards that, that do the unspent red mana thing, which of course also would be great includes in this deck. 
But we got a lot more to build around. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, discard a card, then draw a card. If this is the second time this ability is resolved this turn, Ashling Flame Dancer deals two damage to each opponent and each creature they control. If it's the third time, add four red. And of course, that's why you have the unspent mana thing, I believe. Obviously, casting instants and sorceries, you're doing the spell slinger theme in mono red. Um, I, I mean, you're also doing the copy thing, so you could certainly th throw some copy stuff in here as well. Just being able to, I guess, not loot, rummage. Every time you cast an instant sorcery spell is great. That's great. You could very easily, and I mean, I could throw this in my Brawlin deck because it's going to very easily get me discard triggers. And I, again, I, I had talked about this in a five um, unique builds video, how if you are playing a commander that is looting all the time, right, drawing, discarding, it is very easy for you to throw color hate or vi or specific hate. It doesn't necessarily have to be color hate, like a pyroblast, which you know people probably would throw in this deck anyway. If I'm in a, a game and I have a pyroblast and, and I have a couple opponents playing blue, of course that card is phenomenal. What if no one's playing blue? Well, that's okay. I can just discard it to my commander, right? I mean, funny enough, you can even, I don't know if it's pyroblast or red, red elemental blast. One of those you can cast without actually having a target. So you can just cast it to get a trigger off your commander. Uh, Omen of fire, right? Something like that. Cards that are color hate and you look around and, oh, no one's playing that color. I can just discard it. Or if it just doesn't feel right at the time, but those cards can be obviously incredibly powerful in the right situation. So color hate cards, or let's call it situational hate cards, stuff like that, you can put in this deck for those situations where they could be good. And if they're not good, you just discard them, right? Two damage to each opponent and each creature they control. Jeez, that's pretty good. There's a lot you can do there, obviously, as well. The non-combat damage scenario obviously works here. I will throw that out there. If you throw a Chandra's Incinerator in here, it is going to be really easy to cast, obviously, because if you get that second trigger, it's only going to cost one red mana. And then every time you get that trigger, I guess what will happen is you will do deal two damage to each of your opponent's creatures. And then because you're dealing two damage to the opponents as well, that will trigger your Shanders Incinerator, which will do two more damage. So now you can kill, if they have a four toughness creature in play, you can knock that out as well. And then of course, third time you get mana. I mean, funny enough, that's actually the least usable ability here, I think. I mean, having mana is good, but to, to me, I actually am way more building around. I mean, ma mana is just mana, right? I am way more going to be building around the, the discard and the damage. There's lots you can do there. I actually really like this as a mono red commander. All right, let's talk about a commander that is getting a whole lot of buzz here. Uh, Ulalek Fused Atrocity has a very interesting casting cost. You can pay Wooburg, white, blue, black, red, or green, or you can pay five colorless mana. So, I mean, it, when you build this deck as your commander, it's not going to be difficult to cast because, of course, it's going to be a five color deck. You're going to have you know, all five colors in your deck, but also you can use colorless mana. So any color you're missing, just use colorless mana to cast it. And funny enough, you could actually build a colorless deck. You know, this is kind of like Golos in a way where you can actually, even though this is a five color deck, since you can cast your commander with colorless mana, you don't actually need any mana at all. But anyway, nevertheless, it's a five color commander and it's an Eldrazi. So it is a five color Eldrazi commander that right away, I, I don't love. I think it's kind of silly to have a five color Eldrazi commander. Oh wait, but it has Devoid. So it's actually colorless. That That's always bothered me. You know, obviously Devoid is one of those abilities that have, uh, people always thought was kind of silly. There is not really any logical reason why this is actually a five color commander. It's only five colors so that you can just put all the Eldrazi stuff in here without any limitation, which that kind of bugs me a little bit. But the thing that people are, I think freaking out about more is the ability. Whenever you cast an Eldrazi spell, you may pay two colorless if you do copy all spells you control, then copy all other activated and triggered abilities you control. You may choose new targets for the copies. And that sounds really scary and really, really busted when you first read it. But when you actually start thinking about it, I actually don't think it's that bad. There are certainly some crazy scenarios, sure, but there's 
crazy scenarios with a lot of commanders. There is probably a dozen commanders, at least in the format that just go infinite with one card. So my reaction here is I'm not going to be that terrified of this in the command zone. Not any more than any other Eldrazi commander. I mean, they all have, there's Eldrazi commanders that have absolutely insane abilities. And this is not insane at all compared to some of those other ones. Probably bothers me a little bit more that it's a five color Eldrazi commander. Let's play through the ability here a little bit so that people will understand exactly how it works if you don't know how the rules interactions works. When, when I first read this, the first thing I thought is, okay, you're definitely going to want a ley line of anticipation in this deck, right? Or the Delkin Ori, something like that, right? Because casting your Eldrazi spells at instant speed is going to be really, really important because this only triggers when you cast an Eldrazi spell. People are like, oh, it copies all the spells and all the abilities and all. Sure, but you got to cast an Eldrazi spell. And then it's going to be really, really hard to use if you're not casting your Eldrazi at instant speed, right? People thinking, okay, I got an Evolving Wilds. I'll just crack my Evolving Wilds and then cast an Eldrazi spell and get a copy of it. Okay, but are you casting at instant speed? Because if you're not, you, you can't cast creatures typically at instant speed unless something says otherwise. You have to cast them at sorcery speed, so you have to wait until the Evolving Wilds ability resolves first. If you're thinking, I'll cast an Eldrazi spell and then in response, crack my Evolving Wilds so I can get two lands, that doesn't work either because you're going to, when you cast the Eldrazi spell, copy everything that is currently on the stack. Evolving Wilds will go on after, right? Again, you probably, if you're building this deck and you're not an expert on how the stack works already, you should go watch my stack video so that you know how it works. First in, last out is what matters most. If I put this ability on the stack first, anything that comes after is going to resolve first. So it's not going to apply here. Now, the other situation, the one is probably more likely is those Eldrazi that have cast triggers. Of course, a bunch of them do. They printed a whole bunch more in this set. So if I have an Ulamog, right? A cast trigger that I used to absolutely loathe, it exiles two permanents when you cast it. So of course it will copy all spells and abilities and, you know, and that's an ability, by the way. When you're casting your Ulamog, that's a cast trigger. So it's an ability on the stack. So it will be copied by this. Okay, but you got to pay 10 for that guy and you got to pay another two. So that's 12 mana total. So those scenarios as well, you know, they're good, but you know, I'm not like super scared of that. 12 mana exile four permanence is pretty good, but it's not like super game ending or anything like that. I mean, this is certainly good. Not nearly as scary as I think most people think it is. The one that I find way more terrifying is Aslask the Swelling Scourge, three mana Eldrazi 2-2. Two -two. When Aslask the Swelling Scourge or another colorless creature you control dies, you get an experience counter. And of course, because Eldrazi spawn and Eldrazi scions are sacrificing themselves, and of course, that's what you want to be doing in this deck. Very easy for you to get experience counters here. Very easy. But of course, it has a five color ability. They got to put that on there so you can shoehorn every Eldrazi card into this deck. Wooberg to activate creatures you control get plus X plus X until end of turn where X is the number of experience counters you have. So if you only have four experience counters, your whole team gets plus four plus four until end of turn. But wait, there's more. Scions and spawns you control gain indestructible and annihilator one until end of turn. And of course, the indestructible is good, but the annihilator one is the part that's really scary. Having, I don't know, seven spawns or scions in play, which of course is not super difficult, is going to be terrifying if they all have annihilator one. I mean, that essentially becomes annihilator seven. You got to sacrifice seven permanents. That's, that's game ending stuff. And likely you're going to be sacrificing a lot of your creatures so that you don't have blockers and you'll probably end up just dying, right? I, I'm way more terrified of this one than the other one. The game ending scenario here is a lot more likely in my opinion. If a guy gets six or seven or eight of those scions or spawns in play, it is very easy, I think, for them to knock out one person with this uh, ability. It, it's pretty insane. And again, it's pretty easy for them to get the experience counters because of the scions and the spawns. And of course, again, they printed a whole bunch more in this set and a whole bunch more support for a deck like this in this set. And again, we're back to the, the scenario of they're going to print a commander for every tribe eventually. We've even got a tribal scion and spawn. I mean, they combined them into one commander here. And funny enough, this is another one where I talked about, I believe I talked about this in my last 10 deck ideas video. You know, it's likely I will never do a 10 deck ideas video anymore, sadly, because 
all my ideas are getting taken by all these. Doing Scion and Spawn Eldrazi Tribal was one of those ideas in my last video. So now they've done it, right? Th that's why it's becoming harder and harder to, to do those videos because if I had come up with that video, you know, let's say I came up with that video next week and everyone would be like, uh, Scion and Spawn Tribal, we got a commander for that already. That's a dumb idea, right? So it's becoming harder and harder to do that because they're coming up with a commander for every scenario and a commander for every tribe. So just saying, I know you guys aren't sad about it, but it is making my life a little bit harder. And this commander, I think, is maybe the scariest from the set. Maybe. Omo Queen of Vesuva is a really interesting one. It's definitely one you can go a lot of different directions with. Two in a hybrid Simic mana, Shapeshifter Noble 1-5. When it enters the battlefield or attacks, put an everything counter on each of up to one target land and up to one target creature. So, of course, you can choose land and creature. And, of course... The very important part is you can choose your opponents or yours. Each land with an everything counter on it is every land type in addition to its other types. Each non-land creature with an everything counter on it is every creature type. So of course, as was pointed out to me in the video that I did, the spoiler video I did, land types means Urza, Cave, all those different land types as well, right? So keep that in mind. That is something that you can definitely do here. Obviously there's a lot you can do here, right? I think it would be very easy to build around both abilities. I, I think one thing you could do here is build around, I'm putting the counters on my opponent's lands and the the creature ones are going on my creatures or the reverse. You could do, you know, you could switch it up so that the stuff in your deck is, is dealing with both of those scenarios. That, that would be an interesting way to go. I mean, I'll just throw out a funny old card, Knight of the Mist, right? Knight of the Mist, when it enters the battlefield, you have to pay a blue or you destroy a knight, which of course is meant to destroy itself. But if you put one of those counters on your opponent's creature, right? Your opponent's got some big, scary creature. You purposely don't pay the blue and destroy target knight. So you destroy, of course, because your opponent's creature is now every creature type you can destroy that knight, right? So there's just one example of some of the really interesting things you could do and some of the really interesting cards you could put in a deck like this. This is a super interesting one for sure. All right, Flage, Titan of Fire's Fury, which is a really funny name. Um, not Phage, it's Flage. <laughs> they might be running out of ideas for names as well. Uh, one red and a white Elder Giant. So it's an Elder and it's a 6-6. Six, six. When it enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless it escaped. And of course, we've seen that wording before, right? And yes, this card is essentially doing the same thing as those other ones. When Flage enters the battlefield or attacks, it deals three damage to any target and you gain three life. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty decent. I mean, I, I shouldn't say wow, maybe. I guess in the commander format, that's just okay. It's a lightning helix, right? It's not super great. It's pretty good. Of course, if it enters the battlefield and you didn't escape it, you have to let it die right away. So this is essentially going to be a three mana lightning helix, which isn't great. However, you can respond to that trigger, of course, and you're in red here. So you can do fling effects very easily. Your commander's a 6-6. Six, six. You can have this come down, get those triggers on the stack, and then immediately fling it and get a six damage on top of the lightning helix. I mean, there's there's a lot of shenanigans you can get into here. And I know a lot of people probably think this is a little boring and not very exciting. I like the red and white here, actually, for that reason. Again, you have the fling effects, you, you have life gain you can do, I, again, with the non-combat damage theme. Of course, it's gonna go to the graveyard and you will escape it for red, red, white, white, exile five other cards from your graveyard so you can get it out. And, you know, again, doing the graveyard thing in white and red is, is pretty interesting. That's a unique color combination to do that. You can get it out of the graveyard fairly easily with like a Savine's Reclamation. Obviously, white has a lot of ways to do that. Of course, when it enters the battlefield, it didn't escape, but that's a theme you can really, really build around, actually. And if I have a Terror of the Peaks, now this guy enters the battlefield, I deal three damage and, and gain three life, and also six damage from the Terror of the Peaks. Then I fling it, deal six more damage. It goes to the graveyard. I Savine's Reclamation, get it back. Three damage, three life, six more damage from the Terror of the Peaks, right? I mean, you can really get into some crazy scenarios with this guy. And again, the non-combat damage theme works extra good here. 
because of course your commander's doing it, but also with the terror of the peaks, all, the fling effects, all of that, you can do a lot of that as well. There's actually a lot you can do here. And of course you're also gaining life. So of course, well lost dreams, I think is an auto include in this deck. As I say all the time, it's your best card draw option. If you're in a deck that's gaining life. And also because you have that three life gain, that's a very significant number. A lot of those effects in white that say, if you gain three or more life this turn, uh, you know, at the beginning of your end step or something like that, there's a bunch of those and you are hitting that target with your commanders. So I think there's a lot you can do here. I, I think a lot of people don't find this to be very exciting, but I think there's a lot you can do here. All right, let's get to probably a couple of the most powerful commanders. Certainly the, the, the last one I'll be talking about is the most powerful in the set, I think. This one's pretty powerful as well. Imsker, Iron Eater, six black and a red demon five five and an expensive commander but of course it has affinity for artifacts so this spell costs one less to cast for each artifact you control which i mean that's not hard to do obviously and you are doing artifact tribal in rakdos colors which i think is pretty neat i don't know if we specifically have an artifact commander i mean obviously there's a lot of commanders that work in that theme in rakdos colors this might be our first dedicated artifact commander in Rakdos colors. And I really like Rakdos colors for an artifact theme. And uh, I, again, did a video a while back, an eggs deck I made. Um, and funny enough, that was also a Rakdos deck. And I will throw that idea out here. I think it works really, really good here. If you are thinking of putting this deck together, go watch that video. The egg strategy is a really, really interesting one here. So when Imsker Iron Eater enters the battlefield, you draw X cards and lose X life where X is half the number of artifacts you control rounded down, which is kind of funny. I have not seen that phrasing on a card in a while. They don't use it much anymore the whole half rounded down phrasing. Obviously that's really, really good, right? And getting draw triggers is gonna be pretty easy here, I think. So that's something you might wanna look at here. Also three and a red, sacrifice an artifact. Imsker deals damage equal to the sacrifice artifacts mana value to any target. Wow, so that's also a pretty good ability. Um, you're, you're gonna want, because this is deal damage equal to the sacrifice artifacts mana value, you are going to want some bigger artifacts. One of my favorite cards of all time, Goblin Welder, is obviously going to be a slam dunk in this deck. That's that's pretty much an auto include here. I think you can get that artifact that is like a Spinavish Saw. There's a and a card that used to get played in Commander quite a bit that we don't see much anymore. It's going to be fantastic here. Come into play, destroy something, sacrifice it, do seven damage, I believe goes back to your hand so you can use it again. And obviously the reduction on casting costs for your artifacts is, is gonna be really important as well. I will throw out Semblance Anvil as I do often. That is to me the best way in an artifact deck to get a cost reduction. It's, it's really one of the best ways for cost reduction all around. When it enters the battlefield, you exile a non-land card from your hand. Spells you cast the cherry card type with it. Cost two less to cast and in particular, an artifact creature is absolutely the best thing to exile with it. And in this deck, probably you will have a lot of artifact creatures. So if I end up exiling my Burnished Heart with my Semblance Anvil, now, of course, it's looking for card types. All my artifacts will cost two less to cast and all my creatures will cost two less to cast. And of course your commander is a not an artifact, but it is a creature. So your commander will cost two less to cast. So further cost reduction there. So with just that card in play alone, of course it is an artifact. Plus it reduces, so it's gonna reduce by three. So already your commander only costs five. Pretty powerful ability with both being able to draw a bunch of cards, the affinity for artifacts, sacrificing artifacts to throw damage around. Again, we're in the non-combat damage theme. So what is this, the third commander I'm talking about here where a Chandra's Incinerator might be a great fit. Pretty good commander. I, again, I like Rakdos artifacts. I, I think there's a lot you can do with that. All right, there wasn't a lot of super busted commanders from this set, thankfully. I would say maybe two, maybe three. But Nadu Winged Wisdom is by far the most busted. I think this is the most busted commander I've seen in a long while. And it's kind of funny how... I think I made a comment in one of the spoiler videos before this had gotten spoiled about how they've really kind of been doing Simic dirty uh, for a while. We haven't seen a really interesting 
um, or really powerful Simic commander in a while. A lot of them have been very generic and boring, I find. The last Simic commander, and maybe let's actually go look at it quickly. Okay, so Hackball of the Surging Soul, which came out last year, is actually the third most popular commander right now. Wow. Uh, Merfolk Tribal, I guess, eh? Or not really Merfolk Tribal, it's lands and draw, so it's doing what typical Simic commanders do. Okay, well, people like it, that's fine. This one is kind of, I guess, also doing what Simic it usually does, but it's doing it in a, a very unique and very powerful way. So one green and a blue bird wizard, three, four with flying. And again, as was pointed out on my Discord, because we were talking about this guy quite a bit, just even a three, four with flying for three mana, man. Like the power creep is incredible nowadays. Creatures you control have whenever this creature becomes the target of a spell or ability to reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, put it into your hand. This ability triggers only twice each turn. Now, it's so funny that when the phrasing, this ability triggers only once each turn first came out, so many people complained about it. And what I said is it's not that bad because in Commander... There's four turns you can be doing that, typically. And also, that ability is usually really powerful. It's usually a really powerful ability that you only want it to trigger once each turn, or else it'll be busted. And so, of course, here, where you have this super powerful ability, they decide, ah, eh, once each turn ain't good enough, let's do it twice each turn. Craziness. This will be the most popular commander from this set. This will also likely be the most popular commander in Simic colors, I think eventually. I, I think it's maybe, maybe not. It depends. Obviously it, that's a, that's a bold statement, but it would not surprise me if this became the most popular Simic commander. It is so easy. As I just talked about with the committing a crime from Outlaws of Thunder Junction, just targeting your creatures with spells and abilities. Now, obviously that works on your opponents too, right? Whenever this creature becomes the target of a spell or ability, if your opponent just tries to hit one of your creatures, you get to reveal a top card of your library. If it's a land, you get to ramp. Otherwise you get to draw a card. So again, we're doing the ramp and draw card, which I guess is just a Simic thing to do, but we're doing it in such an, a fantastic, easy way here. So this just becomes every time my stuff gets targeted, I get to draw a card or possibly ramp. Wow. And I have talked about Rain Academy Chancellor quite a bit on my channel as well. I used to have a Rain Academy Chancellor deck, but as I talked about, you could easily put that in the 99 of any deck because it, it is actually really good card draw. Anytime any of your stuff gets targeted, you get the draw card. Here, it's even better because you also get to possibly put a land into play. I have a patron who has a Blind Seer deck, which funny enough works in the 99. <laughs> I mean, so many things work in the 99 of this deck because it's repeatedly targeting, obviously. He has a Blind Seer deck and obviously that's a commander because it's easily targeting stuff. Stuff that targets a lot works in the deck and he had recently purchased Sea King's Blessing for that deck, which is a very interesting card. One blue mana instant. One or more target creatures become blue until end of turn. And of course that's doing the color change thing. So it works in the deck. But the other thing that it does, which he's doing in the deck is it is able to target any number of creatures for only one blue mana. And he pointed out on the discord that he's lucky he got it when he did, because it has skyrocketed in price recently. And the reason why is because it's a slam dunk in this deck for only one blue mana, you can target all of your creatures. So that's what you're going to be wanting to do in this deck. Cauldron of Souls is another card that just so easily targets things. You tap it, choose any number of target creatures. Each of those creatures gain persistence until end of turn, which of course it's already a good ability. You could put a Cauldron of Souls in any deck to save your team, but it's a great way to target any number of creatures. And of course your commander says, whenever this creature becomes the target of a spell or ability, when your creatures become the target of an ability, you get to trigger this. And th like, that's just insane value, right? Um, Sway of Illusion, another one that you're probably gonna wanna pick up a copy of this card for this deck, one in a blue instant. Any number of target creatures become the color of your choice until end of turn, draw a card. So it's already drawing you a card, but this is a easy way to target any number of creatures. 
The other thing that very easily works here is any equipment that equips for zero, which of course, Lightning Greaves being the best example of that. When you equip something, you are targeting it. That is an ability that targets, and of course it's free. So that's the easiest way. And you would save all these other things, all the instant speed things you would save for everyone else's turn. On your turn, you just use your Lightning Greaves, right? On my turn, I'll swap my Lightning Greaves over to my commander. That is now a creature I control being targeted by an ability. I look at the top card and, you know, obviously you're going to want to play the top deck manipulation stuff as well. I put a land into play and then I'll swap my Lightning Greaves back to whatever other creature and this will trigger again and I'll, you know, draw a card or whatever. Just crazy, insane value. This is maybe better than Thrasios. That's right, I will say it. Of course, Thrasios is doing the exact same thing your commander is doing. And yes, Thrasios is probably still better in certain situations where... I have a Seedborn Muse in play and a ton of mana and I'm in tapping on everyone's turn or I have an infinite amount of mana. That's obviously better there. But this, I think, absolutely can be better. Being able to trigger this and you could very easily get into a situation where you can trigger this twice on every single player's turn. So every single player's turn, you are either drawing two cards. I guess that's the worst case scenario is I drew, draw two cards every turn or I am also ramping and putting lands into play. Like this commander is busted i think it is going to be crazy popular it's possible it even gets played in cedh maybe don't know maybe again it's it's very comparable to thrasios i think so it could for that reason you know i haven't even covered the what if i'm actually benefiting my creatures like fight effects there's a great one now i can load this deck up with fight effects and now i'm killing my opponent's creatures on top of putting lands into play and drawing cards, or I'm putting plus one, plus one counters on my creatures. I'm actually benefiting myself on top of all the other things I'm doing. And again, a lot of those fight effects and putting counters on my creatures are instant speed, so you can do them on your opponent's turns as well. And I would play this deck exactly like I play my Danic deck, right? Again, my Danic deck famously just triggers only once each turn. And what I do in that deck is I have creatures that sacrifice themselves. And so I wait to see what happens. On the end step, if no creature card has gone to the graveyard this turn, right, the way you play the deck actually matters a lot. Okay, well now I'll sacrifice a creature or I'll discard a card, I'll do something that will guarantee I get that trigger on that turn. Then the next turn, I wait to see what happens and oh, my opponent discarded a creature card, so now I don't have to worry about it because I already got my trigger. You would do the same here. You would plan out your turn to maximize the value you're getting here. I think it would be very easy to do. I know it's very easy to do because I do it all the time in my Danic deck. Crazy powerful commander in my opinion. All right, there you go. Commanders that I wanted to talk about in this video. I mean, some of them are certainly the most powerful from this set. And I, I would say the ones that are going to be the most popular from the set, I did cover in this video. I think Nadu is certainly going to be the most popular from this set. And a couple others I talked about as well will be pretty popular. I also talked about the ones that I just thought were the most interesting build arounds as well. You guys let me know in the comments below what you think are the most interesting build arounds from this set. Which ones are you going to be going after yourself? Ultimately, this has been a ridiculous set for the commander format. And I will, if you're still watching this video at the very end, I don't know how many people actually stick around to the end of my videos to watch my closing statement, but I have a, what I consider to be a very important video coming out probably next after this video regarding this set. And this set for me is so impactful that it has sort of made me change my outlook on, um, you know, commander and buying cards in general. It's a pretty important video. Um, again, you, you, I know a lot of people are getting really excited about this set, but I would say there's an equal amount of people that are really annoyed by this set because of all the auto includes and strict upgrades and everything in the set is just better than what you're already playing. Again, uh, the thumbnail for my one video, I specifically made it that way for a reason. And Modern Horizons 3 is probably better than what you're already playing. And I wasn't saying that to pump the tires of Modern Horizons 3. I was kind of saying it in, in sort of a sarcastic way. So watch the video that's coming out next. It is, it is more my opinion of where I am at after seeing this set come out. So that is it for today. And thanks for tuning in. Mm -hmm.